Racing fan, man, in studio for the Competition Plus Power Hour. What a great grand Southwestern tour it was for the Monday Morning Racer. But we can talk about that a little later. Talk about it a little bit more on Between the Slicks on Thursday night. Hopefully from, well, we'll keep it as a undisclosed location, but we're in studio tonight. I'm waiting on my co-host Slam and Sam to come in, roll in, but get Good to have you watching along. Dive in that comment section. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me know what you want to talk about in the world of drag racing. Guests tonight. We were going to have Jim Halsey, but Jim Halsey did have to bow out. We'd love to have Jim on the show whenever we can have him. One of the most dominating figures in the door slammer world right now, especially Pro Nitrous. Professional Drag Racers Association. He has had a stellar run here lately in the PDRA for several years, along with Brandon Schweitzer. So they are doing a phenomenal job. Definitely want to talk to Jim Halsey when we get a chance. But as advertised, it will not be so. He had to bow out. But we still got Ryan Ayler and then Elon Warner, who was a uh, winner uh, someone mentioned in the whole movers and shakers people within the NHRA that National Dragster put out. And that is good to see that the sport is recognizing and acknowledging beyond the drivers. Because the fact is, yes, the biggest stars are the drivers, but people help make those people, the drivers, stars as well. There are people behind the scenes and on the scene that they are the movers and shakers. And some of them you know, some of them you don't know. But it was a stellar list for sure. And we're going to be talking to Elon. And always good to talk to Elon because he has got such a grasp on the sport, what's going on, where it should go, where it's been. And he's been able to work with some of the greats in the sport concerning PR and media relations. So we're looking forward to talking to Ryan Ayler and Elon Warner. Now, uh, this show along, we'll be having Ryan Ayler. Very interested to talk to Ryan. Ryan has kept himself busy. You know, Pro Stock Motorcycle, we have not seen them since the Gator Nationals. There's been several events, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Pomona. They were not at. We're going to see them again this weekend at ZMAX. For the Circle K Four Wide Nationals, they're in Concord, North Carolina, just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. They're back on track, but he has kept himself busy. It's going to be interesting to chat with him. Like he was in like a stock car at Pomona going down the drag strip. I want to hear more about that for sure. So look, as you hit the like button, as you hit the share button, as you dive into the comment section, folks. We're going to take a break. Come right back. Slam and Sam will be on as well. We'll continue the drag racing conversation right here on the Competition Plus Power Hour. If you want to take your vehicle's performance to new heights, you got to give it P. Like our original equipment technology, antifreeze and coolant, our formulas match the vehicle manufacturer's technology requirements so that we have the perfect match for every vehicle. That's one reason why Peak is among the fastest growing brands of coolant in America. We work harder to earn the trust of people like you every day. Classic car owners, make your headlights over twice as bright with Holly Retrobright LED headlights. A plug-in replacement for those dim halogen seal beams, Retrobright maintains that classic look and lasts six times longer. Stay safe and click the link below to learn more. Slamming, Sam. What are we going to slam on tonight? 
Um, well, finish up some body armor and for sure some Red Bull. All right. That, all right. Those, are, those are two guaranteed that I'm slamming. Right. right. So Man. you're going to be hyped up to talk about some drag racing. What we'll, we'll talking about? I'm, what we slamming on in drag racing? Slamming on a Jag racing, man, I've been seeing a lot of cars being brought out, uh, guys working on stuff, door slammer stuff, um, you know, more guys and girls getting into the nitro rank. So excited about that. People coming out in pro stock, as you know, I'm a fan of that class. Um, you know, the, the corral is getting bigger. If you get my reference right, there. Yes, uh, yes. 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 Um, and they make really great Western wear too. Um, they do. They as do. that's I another mean, thing. This? There's, uh, there's someone you know, you know even closer than I do. I think we need to give a shout out, Lizzie Musi. Oh, put, I, I was. Put, so, hey, girl, you know, pray yes. for you. Put the work in. Do put up the good fight, and we're oh. thinking about you. And I know the Competition Plus uh, dot com gang has has said so beyond even the show, and we're saying it here that. Uh, Certainly, we hope that you pull through. Yes, I was definitely going to get there. To I, I call her, and we have an ongoing joke. Even Kai Kelly knows. I call her my PRI wife every year at PRI since I've started going. Uh, every year we take a picture together, and we, um, you know, we just laugh, talk about the season, talk about whatever. Uh, we keep in touch um, through a couple of group chats. But yes, Lizzie, Pat Musi. Um, and, and I just want to take a second to any of you guys that are out there, you guys need to get tested too. As someone who's went through it has to have mammogram and ultrasounds. And I'm going to make, try to make it through this without getting emotional, but get tested, man. If you, if you feel like something's weird, if you feel like there's something that you don't know about, um, please go and see your doctor, go and get tested, go and go and figure it out because it is a scary moment. I've obviously gone through surgery, gone down to Arizona a couple of times, but don't be scared to speak about it. Talk about it. It's something that it one in every thousand guys. And think about that one in every thousand men that potentially have it don't survive. Uh, women, obviously, you know, their, their scare and their situation is totally different, but, um, it's 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 one of those things, man. You the the cancer world doesn't care who you are, what you are, what creed, culture, religion. You know, if you like race cars, if you like funny car, pro stock, pro mod, baseball, basketball, it doesn't matter, man. It's just one of those things where it's it's there. It's it's crazy, but honestly, and I'm gonna say this again: if you're a man out there and you feel something, don't think, "Hey, I'm too manly to go through this." because it can happen. I mean, I have the scars to prove it. And if you want to see them, you can message me, but I've, I've gone through the surgeries and I have to go and get mammogram and ultrasounds every year. So, um, yeah. So there's that bit, Lizzie, stay strong. You got this, you got a great guy by your side and Kai, and you guys are going to make it through it. What, I mean, so since we're talking about no prep Kings, do I like the format? Oh, I can't help but wonder why are they bothering to try something? I think at this point is because everyone it, it, it's try something new because everyone says, well, the old rules are just, you know, Ryan's going to run away with it. But you know what I mean? Because he's done it for years. So if it ain't, you know, if he, everyone says if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I mean, I like what I'm what even if you're not talking about the rules, I like all the new body changes that we're starting to see. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, look, that is something that in the NPK world, they're doing a fantastic job of that. They have cars that look like, well, what? The street car. I mean, look, they're they're like, slow pro mods. Let's call it what it is. But they look I mean, like it's a, pro, car. it's a it's a pro mod. Like, I don't care what you say. I mean, it's a pro mod chassis and it, it's a chassis car. But at the end of it, it's something, and I think that's what has, because people always talk about, when you talk about no prep kings, why is it so relatable? Why has it done so well? Because when we were first talking about it, everyone was saying, well, it isn't going to work. It isn't going to last. It's not sustainable. But it actually is, and it's proven itself because these guys and these girls are going out there and they are driving stuff that looks similar to what you see on the street to what when you go to cars and coffee what those guys and girls have granted yes these are chassis cars versus you know the manufactured car but it's still something that you can fathom being made 
in your garage or in your shop or whatever you may have. You know, it it's it's fathomable to the imagination. It's accessible to the imagination, too, because you're like, man, that's something that I can do or I can eventually turn my car into this, which also is benefited to the YouTube channels. You look at how many YouTubers have come or, you know, have said, you know what, I'm going to make a YouTube channel so you guys can watch me build my car, which granted, that'd be, you know, a cool segment for me to do. But I don't want people to know what I'm doing in my car. I like secrets. I'm like the old school fashion, like, you know, have the small block car and be like, hey, man, you want to race? And they say, yeah, they agree to the race. And then you bring out the pro mom. They're like, I didn't agree to that. No, you said you wanted to race. You didn't say what you were racing. You just said you wanted to race. So. I think that's where that sustainability has come from. Uh, I had the conversation with another guy a couple of days ago about that. And I think you're going to see it with rule changes, obviously becomes more drama, more headache, more what's going to happen next. And Discovery and Pilgrim have linked together and said, okay, how do we make this and how do we build it and how do we keep the drama of the street world in it, but also make it a corporation deal. I think the key word in everything you said, as the Australians say, drama. <laughs> drama. Yes. I think that is why they are making this move. It is all about drama. It's not about the competition, though there will be competition. It is to create within the MPK world more drama because, honestly, I think that's what a lot of people flock to that series four, even over the competition, because they have been able to attract people who may not be a mainstream drag racing fan, and they've got caught up in the characters and the drama with those characters. And if you start having teams at that level, uh, and they're pitted against each other and pitted against each other within the teams to try to advance themselves within you're going to get exactly that drama. So I think that is what this move is about. Personally, I'm not a big fan of something like that. I mean, look at how many people complain about team orders just in the NHRA world. And yeah, you're going to possibly have that happen in the MPK world. I don't know how that is going to be received. Again, I think this is a move to showcase drama. Drama sells on TV for sure. I think that is what is happening with the NPK move. Sam, uh, you know, <laughs> we speaking of drag racing, drag racing is going to take a pretty hard hit this weekend because it seems like most of the people are drag racing on the East Coast, and the East Coast is about to have a goalie washing scenario up and down throughout. I have seen postponement and cancellation. You look at, for example, at the Z-Max uh, drag race with the Circle K four wide nationals. I think one of the best pictures, Doug Foley Jr. He was showing, hey, I'm on my way. And he had his galoshes up on the dash as he's driving down the road. He's like, I don't know if these are tall enough for what we're about to experience this weekend. So, Tough weekend for drag racing already. Mon soon. Yes. Like, <laughs> I mean, bring, please, I, like, this is what I want to see. Like, we saw a little glimpse of it in, in Gainesville, right? When they had the rains and everything like that. We, we saw it last year. I want to see someone out there in some knee-high or shortly below the knee muck boots with some waders cut into like short shorts and one of the red, I mean, one of the yellow hats. Cause I think we're going to have that much. <laughs> like I was looking, look, Lee, I was looking, I'm like, man, I got the weekend off. I should go down there. And I'm like, I wonder what the weather's going to be. So I called my buddy that lives down there and he's like, yeah, dude, uh, everyone else is kind of planning on staying indoors. So yeah, unless you want to go swimming, I just, yeah. So I don't know, but you know, Lee, it's funny. Whenever we think this is going to happen to a race, it doesn't happen. Well, you, you that's the strange thing is you still kind of have to show up. 
and be prepared and be ready because I expect fully they're going to race on Monday. Uh, the weather looks great on Monday, so I fully expect Monday they're racing. And I will say from the chaos world, everybody, y'all pray for Chris Graves. <clears throat> he needs it. He had a good run. He had a good run of like six, seven years, no weather issues. First three races of the year have been touched by weather. Stellar moves across the board so far in moving the races. Texas postponed one week, got it in beautiful weather. Postponing Louisiana down there in Baton Rouge at State Capitol Raceway. They're going to be the last race wait, of the wait, year wait, championship wait, wait, finals. Wait, 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 but, yeah, we've already wait, had to move the wait, first Nitro wait. Chaos race. Lee, what'd you call that place? What part of Louisiana? Baton Rouge. Not Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. Rouge, not Rouge. We don't like the Rouge. Baton oh, Rouge. But that's that's like Greenville, Greenville here. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's like like it's Greenville. It's just like people don't say Louisville. Like I say, Lou. It's Louisville, and now nah, they're Louisville. like, nah, Louisville. It Louisville. I'm like. It's not what the bat says, okay? It's not what the bat says. It's not what the bat, right? It's not what the bat says. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, Lee, since since I'm wearing this, I have to. We we have to talk. I mean, I mean, I don't think we can ever have a show. And with the news that was brought out here this weekend by NHRA and everything like that, fandom here. Now, after being there last year, I talked with. Um, I talked with them and kind of was looking around. I'm like, what are you guys going to do with the house situation? And I forget her name right off the top of my head. Oh, my gosh. She was on the show. Tammy. Yeah, Tammy. I looked at her and I said, Tammy, what are you going to do? And she goes, we already know what we're doing. So I didn't make a big deal out of it. I was like, okay. We already like. The fact that they're saying they already know. I mean, Sporty and the whole crew there, Tammy, they've. They've got things under lock. And I just, I believe, I mean, we're going to, we, we've seen it. We've seen it in Houston. We're seeing it other places is that people are starting to develop out of these city limits. 10, 15 years ago, these places, I mean, you used to be able to go up there. When, the first year I went up there, there was three homes, you know, on the other side of the highway there. You know, I went for the World Series of Pro Mod that one year and I'm like, dude, there's three homes over here. Okay, whatever. And then you go back the next year and you're like, okay, there's 10, 15 homes. I went back last year and there was a damn community up there. So it's just like, you know, it sucks to see because that place is, that place is one of a kind. I mean, when are you ever going to get that view of having the red rock in the back of the, you know, in the back of the pits driving down into your, you know, the staging lanes it's fun going down, not so much going up, running up the stairs there. I mean, that's a scenic and a historical place. So, you know, I'm we already know it's going to be packed, but I think they are going to pack that place out to nobody's business. And the the fire marshals, the chiefs, the state, the city, everyone local to that township is going to be there and know like, hey, this may be the last race here, but it ain't going to be the last one that you see in the mile high. Uh, yes. You know, I had a window of opportunity to make it last year, not for the national event, event but for another event after being at Kearney, Nebraska, for funny car chaos. And I wasn't able to make it. Definitely. I want to see that place in its now state before it is whatever it will be houses, you know, houses, warehouses, whatever. But Sam, you know, you referred to Tammy being on the show. That was sometime last year. She mentioned even on that show, then they have a plan. And she even hinted at in that episode that that plan may not include the very place that they're at. I think people thought it was farther on down the road, but they've had this plan for a while. And I got wind of this announcement coming about a month and a half ago. I wasn't shocked when it dropped. And for everyone out there also, you can believe what you read from competitionplus.com. 
you know, old Bobby Bennett, boss man, caught some flack for dropping a rumor. Well, a lot of people need to eat some crow because the very next day it was announced that, that rumor was not a rumor. It was the truth. So when you read it on Comp Plus, it's the real deal. Let me say that. What we have, though, is not a problem with drag racing. Drag racing is extremely healthy. What we have a problem with is, as you alluded to earlier, we, are, we have facilities that at one time they were out in the middle of nowhere. But as population has grown, the middle of nowhere has been pushed out further and they are caught in the middle. Prime example, my home track, which is no more, Atlanta Dragway. There was a day in time, Atlanta Dragway, Commerce, Georgia, was this little backwater exit that you could take to get to Athens if you wanted to or go to northern Georgia, and that is it. But see, Lee, it's more than it's more than just drag racing, because if you look at that whole Red Rock area, and I've been there a couple of times, and when I, I will be there this year, so I'm letting you know we need to get there like a day or two early so we can hit up some of the eateries. And if Darren wants to come up, I think that'll be great. He can be our camera guy and, you know, write a story about how much food we eat. So, Darren, I see you in the comments. Put that on your calendar and let us know if that's okay. But um, you think about that whole little community, right? You turn off the freeway, interstate, highway, whatever you want to call it, depending on which, you know, part of the world you live in. Um, but you, huh? no, it's not really an expressway there. I mean, it's not a bypass, as we would say, but no, it's not really. But you get off, right? And then you turn, and right at the end of that, um, there is, yes, Darren, finally, you we agree on something. They do have some bomb chicken fried steak with gravy. But um, there's a gas station that's there, right? And normally, if you get there early in the morning, like the first time I went, I obviously wanted to see the Red Rock Amphitheater. So you go there. You know, you got to think about that place, too. Like, Okay, there's a there's a small community of people that live at the bottom that, you know, it's it's very tourism there. So is that going to be affected by this? I mean, that's a big tourist attraction. Right. So are they going to say, you know, hey, no more Red Rock Amphitheater? I don't really think you can really get away from that. But, you know, people do yoga there. And I mean, you go there and there's and when I say hundreds of people. Hundreds of people there at eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday doing yoga running up and down the stairs and you're like what in the world it's it's a totally different atmosphere right you drive back down and then you turn in turn down this gravel road with this extremely massive parking lot just a gravel parking lot and you're like what can possibly go on here and right up the road there there's a drag strip when you're sitting in the drag strip you're looking down you know onto the drag strip and you look even further and there's the highway, interstate, whatever. And then on the other side of that, there's like a little lake where you can see people wakeboarding and water skiing and different. And it's just like this little community of motorsports and athletic and, and, you know, scenery is all being taken over now, like you said, by housing developments and, and, you know, retail market stores and different things like that. And it's, what are we coming to? How do we, support our tracks and how do we stand up for our tracks and say you know what hey just because you're moving in here you know what you're moving into like it's not like you didn't know when you look across the street like damn you know that's a drag strip like you know that when i mean i'm sorry but my dad was in real estate i've got a lot of friends in real estate you drive around the community which you want to live in you do like you Google search, I mean, you Google search or you ask, you know who, I don't want to say her name because she'll prop, pop up, but you Google search, oh, I want to look in this area and see what's around there, you know? So my problem with this all is that's like me saying, hey, I want to build a house right here, but right behind it is an outdoor hockey rink and I'm pissed off because every winter someone shoots a puck through my basement window and hits my 60 inch TV. Well, I should have probably driven by there and been like, hey man, what's right there? Or you see these people that I've got a buddy, he lives right off of the eighth hole of a golf course. 
his insurance on the one side of his house is a lot more, you know, because every year someone hits a golf ball into his window. He knew that when he built his house that, hey, there's plans in the next four years of a golf course coming in here. You can either plant trees, you can do whatever you need to do, but I it just irks my nerves to know beyond of people that get mad because these facilities are there. But we as, you know, generations as whatever we want to call it, will complain that people are out street racing, will complain that people are playing video games and that they have nothing to do, but the things that they are doing, you take them away. You take away a drag strip, so now they're street racing. You don't want them out street racing, so now they're sitting in the house playing video games. Like, which which one do we want? Which in the longevity of it helps? And and who knows? Maybe our first guess, you know, he's doing different things from motorcycles to cars and everything else. Who knows? Maybe he has the answer um, about what we do about these drag strips, but I'm, I, I just don't get it. Oh, look. I and, look. Andrew's I, saying the same thing I just said. Right, right. I am convinced that we, we need something that. <laughs> I just saw her. Look, it's gone. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not the one to, to create and draft the legislation, but. We need like PRI, an entity like that, crafting legislation for local tracks that feel entroached upon to, hey, protect that we've been here longer than the community or just as long than this one moving in. I think a great example of the fighting is what happened down at Brainerd, Florida and oh, yeah. the, the compromise and, you know, literally compromise the way it's supposed to work between several parties in that particular situation. Now, I do think the Denver situation, in particular, you know, the Bandemir situation is a bit different. They realize, okay, this is not the heel to die on. We need to make a move now, and we'll establish something hopefully better elsewhere with an even longer history ahead of them. That seems to be the case in this situation. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, they're the the Bandamere family, they're two steps, five steps ahead of what's going on. You know what I mean? Like they've they they have prepared for this and they knew what it was, you know, a few years ago during COVID when you know they fought the fought then. Um uh, when they fought the fight then, not fought the fought, but so they they knew then what was going on and what they were happening. But Lee, I understand your point, but I have to disagree with you. We can't get our local government and our local people to be on the same page about that the freaking sky is like orange and pink in the morning and then it goes blue and then it goes dark. So, I mean, I don't really think that we can trust half of those people to even make a logical decision on like, hey, this place has been here. So, I mean, hey, but... It just like, like I said, I mean, understand where you're, where you're at and where you're going to be moving and like, understand your community and your development. Like, I get it. You want to have your, you know, your glass windows, but you have to understand that someone else's livelihood or someone else's business has been there. Perfect. Another perfect example of this before we break to our guest, I'm thinking, but Cletus McFarland, I mean, the guy's made made a name for himself on YouTube, but he bought the Freedom Factory when there was nothing around it. He could go out there at one o'clock in the morning and do whatever he wanted, or he could go out there at nine o'clock at night and do whatever he wanted. And now all of a sudden these developers want to come in and say, hey, this is cheap land. Let us buy it and do this. Like, It, it just makes no, like, I don't know. I guess for me, it makes no sense. It just got to be smarter than the average bear of knowing what's next to you before you decide to buy a house there. 
I look, I agree. I agree. Well, look, I bought a house talk. near I bought a house near an airport and it's just so loud at eight o'clock in the morning. Right. But I didn't realize I lived in LA and you know it's an international airport. Right, right. That sounds like Darren. <laughs> Darren's like right over the he lives like right under the path. The and, flight uh, path? In Inglewood, yeah, they fly like right over his house. It's not that bad, really, though. It's not, like I grew see like where I grew up in San Diego. You literally growing up as a kid, you looked up and you're like, man, that plane. I could if I could throw a rock as hard as I could, or if I build a a potato launcher, I could for sure. I I know I can. And there's dude, there's been days where it's like, I wonder how much trouble I would get into if I had a potato oh, launcher and just oh, woof woof. Like Alone. one time, just one time. I've thought about it. That's but. all it would take. One time. You'd be- <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know what I mean? Like I knew that every day, every three minutes, possibly when they were landing, there was probably going to be a plane that flew over. And right. after a while, it just became normal. Bingo. Bingo. All right. Let's take a break. Next up, flying Ryan Ayler right here on the Competition Plus Power Hour. Competition Products, your source for hardcore engine parts for street, strip, and oval track. Our free catalog is packed with hundreds of product lines from the best-known manufacturers in the performance industry. Lowest prices guaranteed. Free shipping and handling on all orders over $149 in the continental U.S. Need expert advice? Our knowledgeable staff is just a phone call away. Competition Products, race parts sold by racers since 1970. Ryan, man, welcome to the show. Look, first of all, I didn't get the chance to catch up with you at Pomona. You were there, and I've got to ask, why in the world were you there? The bikes weren't there, but you had this stock car-like thing. What was going on, man? Well, as you know, El Bandito Yankee Tequila is our primary sponsor, and uh, you'll have to bear with me. We're traveling down the road in the mountains right now on the way to Virginia to test. So if you get poor reception or you see the camera, you know, shake really bad, it's uh, potentially uh, these wonderful roads in, in Pennsylvania that we're currently in right now. So, um, and of course, reception could be an issue. So, uh, but yeah, we were in Pomona. Uh, we were putting on a midway display for El Bandito Yankee Tequila. And on the way there, we picked up a NASCAR uh, that happened to be at Phoenix International Raceway that they uh, do a driving experience with. So we brought that with us. And of course, we had to drag race it. And it wasn't as impressive down the drag strip as everyone would have hoped, but it was a was a great time and, and a great marketing tool for sure. Yeah, what was it like taking a stock car down the uh, drag strip? What was the best time? Uh, I got it to crack into the 14s. Uh, it wasn't uh, your competition style NASCAR. It had like a stock 350 in it, but it felt a lot faster than that because it's like driving a 10 can around and. Uh, you know, the funny thing was, was when we got there, we unloaded it. We'd go down to tech and we're talking to tech. And um, the car had like a real low, uh, soft rev limiter in it so that if the students are taking it and, you know, going to get it into high gear to go around the oval, they can't they can't run it through the gears and, you know, really drive the car. So, of course, we had to unplug that because that was uh, hindering uh, our performance. And then, uh, you know, it took me half an hour to find reverse. Um you know, you know, I'm a motorcycle guy. Even though I've raced cars and all this, this is not something I've raced before. I've never been in a in a NASCAR, and uh, but so I said, you gotta let me practice this thing. I can't go out on Saturday in front of uh, you know, thirty thousand people and uh, and kill it off the starting line. So, so we got to play with it on the return road and get one practice run, and uh, and everything went pretty good. It was a, uh, I didn't miss any gears. Uh, I, I banged the gears as best I could, spun it pretty good off the line, but it was uh, it was an interesting moment, none the least. Hey, I, I was impressed with obviously a car not designed to go drag racing. Burnout, the little burnout was good. The, 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 the left good, and it kept trucking on down there. I, it, was, it, was, it was cool, man. Well, I mean, I grew up racing anything that they would allow me to race. So, I mean, I know how to drive a stick. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted to make sure I didn't make a fool of myself in front of all the fans and the, the fully lettered El Bandito car and be the, the, you know, the guy that everybody could make fun of after the day was over. So I, at least I, I kept my composure 
and uh, and held my head high, even with a 1490 pass. But the funny thing is about any racer, you get your, you know, at the end of the track, and they're like, what do you think you ran? And the past before, I ran like a 1540 or something like that. So I said, I think I ran a 1490. And I said, I think I cracked into the 90s. And I went like 1494 at 90 some mile an hour. So it was, it was a good guess, you know, but uh, I got a cleaner 2-3 shift. That was all, you know, that was the, and I killed the tire speed with the 1-2 shift. So, and of course, you can only say so many days of thunder quotes in the week leading up to that. I mean, I've completely rehearsed that movie now a million times. Because one, I only watch race movies on the way to a race. So I either watch Rush, Days of Thunder, uh, Talladega Night. Uh, I don't have a vast selection of race movies, but, you know, I, I keep it uh, keep it somewhere in there. You got to throw at least the Fast and Furious 1 and 2 in there, right? I need to download that. I don't have that on my iPad yet, but that's a good I mean, I'm a supporter of Fast and Furious, even though it's goofy as hell. And, you know, you can jump a Dodge Charger off a mountain and, with the cable attached to it and swing it into a hillside and everybody's fine. But, action so all right ryan for you i mean you stayed pretty active during the off season right now you said you're going to test before you guys you know jump on the track but for you this off season what do you think the biggest change coming into this season is going to be for you um or what is you know a rule or a, you know regulation that they've maybe implemented that you're like yeah i don't know about that one Uh oh, we're playing. See, see, but Lee, you know what he did that was right before he got on and before he started. He let us know in his. I got your back. Oh, oh see, all right. Oh no, we got one bar. This could be bad. Not the good kind of bar. All right. Anyway, what's happened for us that's going to make us turn this page around for our program is, one, we got a reliable engine platform right now. We've spent the off season in the on the flow bench, in the engine dyno, and everything is finally getting to be how it's supposed to be in the sport where you're using your off season to your advantage. You're, you're developing, you're finding, you know, creating new uh, prototype parts that then you're having manufactured. And then you're testing them and then of course you're hunting for horsepower in the past you know we really haven't had time to do that because we've been constantly having reliability issues and you know all this has plagued us over time yes we had some good success at some events and you know we've got a couple wins and some you know five six top five or uh, final appearances but we had a, a moment there in time where everything was working we made just a couple more horsepower and that whole program just went to hell so then we said just hunt down and search for, you know, reliability and what we were going to do to get back where we were. So then we got back to where we were with a whole new platform that just gives us lots more potential. And we got it working at the end of the year. And then we've now just focused on holding that in. Uh, our brand new bike that's coming out. Uh, we've been working every day in the engine dyno and in, in the test lab. And this is all going to show that by the end of the season, our team's going to have 10 to 20 more horsepower and we'll be right right up there at the top of the heap and uh we're headed the right direction our team is really solid and these are all things you got to have to move forward in the program and uh, we're all really excited because you build your own engines and you, you you create your own horsepower you're also going to create your own success so you know there's no one holding us back but ourselves and we're uh we're definitely on top of the hill now and you're going to start working our way through this through this ladder of competition now, of course, the rules, the rules, as you know, are potentially shaded one direction right now. But NHRA does a really good job of honoring this and, and doing what they can to uh, to keep the class close and competitive because, you know, there's not just one sponsor out there. There's not just one program. So they have to they have to do their best they can to keep this as uh, even as possible. And it's tough in a class with. 160 cubic inch motorcycle versus 113 cubic inch motorcycle and uh and then of course there was like four 
tips that went in favor of the Suzuki platform last year. And, you know, at that moment, maybe it evened it up. But, of course, those guys are also developing and making more power. So as their programs advance, rules, rules have to be changed. Uh, speaking of rules, this a safety one. We actually have had this chat on my Between the Slicks. Andrew wants to know, what are your thoughts on boots versus shoes in Pro Stock Motorcycle? Does NHRA need to mandate? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a motorcycle. You know, you have the least amount of protection of any class out there in racing. And uh, I, I got into the sport. Uh, I got my, my suit made by Bates Leathers. It was, you know, said to be the best suit manufacturer out there. I went and met them. I got sized. Uh, I didn't even consider anything other than, than a racing boot. Now, you do have different kinds of racing boots and different kinds of applications that for different motorcycle racers that are that say they can't feel the peg. Well, you know, they've made these, these boots custom now that have a different sole and you know, adapt to some of the rider's needs. So um, none of us want to tumble down these racetracks. But if we do, I sure as heck don't want to have a set of Nikes on, I'll tell you that. Hey, I mean, if you got a nice pair of Nikes on, send us a picture. We'll put those on drag racing uh, shoe game, when you know. Oh, let's see. There you go. We need to add you to... We need to add you to the Instagram page then. I'm just glad I didn't get a hip cramp when doing that. I'd be sitting over here crying. I I am I am impressed though. I mean, did you see that form Lee? He grabbed the whole foot, so he must he must have been stretching during the off season. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you've kind of changed your whole program around since I've met you, right? I mean the the toter, the the new trailer, the way everything's set up for you. Having this you know, sponsor come on and or marketing partner come on with you and someone that is, you know, helping you build your program and you're building your program. What is it like now to have your race shop grow a little bit and having all the extra parts that you may need or be able to bring that kind of stuff to the track with you week in and week out? Well, you know, I mean, resources are key to this program. You know, having what you, you know, being ahead of the game in the off season, be reordering the parts that you need for uh, development. And of course, now things have changed in our, in our whole business. Is stuff's not as readily as available as it used to be. So you got to kind of be ahead of that game. Um, it, it's challenging, for sure. And at the same time, you know, this, having this this sponsor, this is this is great. This is what we've always wanted. When you get into the sport, you say, well, "I can't wait till one day, you know, I'm going to have a big sponsor." You think just give me now to NHRA, that's going to happen. And then the whole entire marketing program of sponsorships has kind of changed at the same time that I've gotten out here. So, you know, uh, what we do is, you know, we are a marketing partner. And by becoming a marketing partner of a company, you basically essentially start to work for that company and you promote them and you show them a return on their investment. And the more you can do that, the more they're going to get behind you. Um, the days of just getting a, a big sticker on the side of your bike and a big fat check. Uh, are gone so what can you do for your sponsor to to make them money and gain them exposure and that's you know that's the name of the game so you know we actually have way more responsibilities than we used to have i mean we're going to tracks uh like you saw in pomona we worked four 16 hour days in a row we set up every day on the midway we went to four different uh, bars and restaurants every night we uh sold track you know the concessions all carried our tequila and had margaritas. We had a car on display. We worked in the Midway every day. We went out every night and did sampling at these restaurants. I mean, it was a, uh, luckily we're used to working hard. That's, that's not an issue for us, but boy, you know, you got to have a really solid group of guys behind you to go through all that because, you know, we're all, uh, we're all working at this together. And then of course, now you go to a race weekend, same thing. You'll be doing, you know, events. We'll go to bars and restaurants on Thursdays. And uh, right, in Gainesville, right. we did uh, a, a World of Beer. We did a uh, uh, Miller's Ale House. And we did two sampling events on Thursday. I mean, we were out the whole day uh, doing, you know, tasting and sampling events. So 
And then now Joliet, we're going to have not to mention a midway, a hospitality area. And we're also going to have a whole bunch of super influential athletes and stuff from the Chicagoland area that are all involved in the El Bandito company there that we're going to entertain and, and expose to NHRA drag racing. So uh, talk about adding something to your plate when you're already full, but it's the only way that you're going to get ahead in this game is to, uh, to find some help so you can find some, some dollars to get behind your program because you know money buys speed and you know this sport is is definitely expensive so you got to find a way to uh to manage that uh or just be filthy rich so since that's never been an option for me i'm just going to figure out the way i can work for it so i can uh so i can be out here and kick some butt uh sampling schedule like can, can we get it like where, where, where's it at i mean i we can follow along and make sure I, you know, all the samples are, are ready to go. I'm literally sitting on 12 cases of tequila right now. Like literally this, this bench that I'm on is opens up, you know, for the, the dinette bedroom area. Well, that's all tequila. Just Ryan, something. be careful. That's I, like, it's gotta be like illegal transportation across state lines or something. Going. <laughs> it's good, good, good point. <laughs> This is for consumption. This isn't distribution. Not, this is for consumption. <laughs> Sir, where are you going with all that? Well, I'm going to be in this state, this state, this state, and that state. And in the sport I am, this is all for us to drink. Yes. Like we are we, we are going to drink this all in one weekend. Trust me. <laughs> well, not just us, but yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> I told that to El Bandito. We started doing these events. They're like, you know, uh, you went through nine cases of tequila this week, and I said you put up a sign that said "free tequila." You don't think that the fifty thousand people at the racetrack are going to come over and get a shot of tequila? So and we had to then put up tasting at one o'clock and then tasting at three o'clock because, yeah, you know, it is a uh, it it is an easy thing to go through at the racetrack. It, it is not to mention uh, a fast sport. It's also it appears to be a drinking sport for the spectators. So. Um, Come on by. <laughs> see, by see 9 a.m. See, senor. <laughs> oh, Ryan. Go ahead, Sam. I know last year you did your, I forget the name of it, your expo with, you know, the drag cars down in Florida. How is that? All Tampa going Bay for Race you? Rentals. Yeah, Tampa Bay Race Rentals. How is that going for you? It's going pretty good. You know, I mean, we're uh, gaining some momentum in it. We're uh, continuously, you know, advocating drag racing and that we are uh, we're going to keep uh, keep this program going. It's really rewarding to see uh, new people get involved in the sport and show them and teach them about drag racing and get them behind the wheel. Every single person who has done it. Um, I just did a program uh, last Saturday with uh, with Robert, who's with us, uh, who's also, you know, he's Nutsense, he's El Bandito, he's Flying Line Racing, so he's been working with us for a while. But just to see these people, just the, their emotions are priceless. You know, it's, it's a great thing. So I've got to find a little bit more time to get down there and do some marketing uh, activities, which is coming. And we're going to, we've got some big stuff coming up can't talk about it right now per se but you know we've got something happening in that line of uh, our business that's going to be really exciting as well well that is uh great to hear uh, ryan look definitely hope that uh, we get racing in this weekend and that the racing that uh, you all get in includes a lot of wind lights at the circle k four wide nationals on your <clears throat> fast motorcycle and uh, look forward to seeing you there at the track, man. Uh, hey, one thing to put into this. You know? Yeah, this this conversation started with hearing about, you know, what's going on with these drag strips disappearing and what can we do? You know, I mean, um, I'm I'm nervous about Bradington. I love Bradington and I love what Cletus has done down there. Um, you know, Showtime, which is where we run Tampa Bay Race Rentals, is in the heart of Clearwater, Florida. You want to talk about um some some land that has some value i mean you're talking about something that is in the middle of a city and it is uh 
it's it scares us, you know, because uh, we, uh, you know, we don't want to lose it. Well, that track uh, got it marked as a historical site. So that track technically I don't think is going to go anywhere because it has been marked as a historical site. Um, you know, and of course, I think we need to toughen up. You know, we're drag racers. People who own drag strips. These are businesses. But, you know, uh, if things start, people are trying to push us out, we need to man up and we need to get some people behind us and we need to get to uh, do something to try to make the program work work better for us because you know i mean you got uh i had my neighbor i pulled my rv and rig in front of my house in florida and my neighbor said hey the neighbors are complaining you know and uh you know you're gonna you know you need to move your rig and i said i said just tell them to call the cops i said do you come out every single day you write me a ticket for 10 days in a row and uh and i'm not moving and i said it's cost me it will cost me less to take a ticket every single day than it will be to move to a different location so hey you know these drag strips that are out there in these neighborhoods you know of course you're going to have some flack and you're going to have some problems with uh the people that are, that are moving near these tracks but you know we need to toughen up and we need to get behind our local race tracks and we're going to make it work so um, i'm all for it and i love i love this grassroots race tracks and i don't want to see any more of them disappear i'm sure we will see more of them disappear over time but we need to also look at some of the new tracks that are being built around the country and uh and get behind them and support them at the same time good word ryan good word i like that i like that a lot so all the track owners that are out there anybody that knows a track owner we're marking your track now as a historical spot so just yep. <laughs> I mean, tomorrow everyone needs to submit the paperwork and we're going to get a movement yeah so. i mean you, you, there's always a way you know i mean what makes one lawyer better than another lawyer is he really knows how to find the, the fine print and make it work so work those gray areas and let's go after it i like it i like it well man we're gonna let you get after it you pulled up to the fuel island go ahead and take yourself a break and uh, thank you for coming on the show man all right guys thanks for having me See Thank ya. You. There you go, Lee. Everybody just needs to get a buffalo and get like four goats and two pigs or something like that. It's a farm, right? And now it's a farm and a petting zoo, and it's farm, a historical zoo, drag strip. <laughs> like, we always say go. that these facilities need to be multi-purpose. You can't be more multi-purpose than that. And if you need an exotic animal, we know a guy that was on this show earlier last year before Thanksgiving and he has some hookups on some exotic animals. Yeah. So. Well, you know, we can just call Mr. Freeman. They're right across the street. From, well, those, exotic those exotic animals, animals are totally differently. <laughs> <laughs> hey, drag racers in and of themselves are exotic animals. Very. Yeah, exactly. What he was talking about 12 cases of tequila being gone by probably 10 AM. Right, right. For sure. Drag for racers. sure. Oh, speaking of exotic animals, Elon Warner is one of the most exotic animals out there. Period. And he I don't even know. Done, if, man. I don't even know if you can call him an exotic animal. Like, I mean, I don't. I don't. What? Like, honestly, okay. Before we even bring him on, before he can say anything, yeah. we need to make right. him like redder than the red starburst right. in the I pack. Got like, I got it. Like, I thought it. He is like, like the albino peacock, full feather display. <sighs> No, it's got to be better than that. Come on, come on. It's got to be better. Like, Elon Warner is one of those guys that, like, oh. I don't even know, man. Like, he needs a movie, like, for all the things that he's done. And then, like, the knowledge that he has, like, He's like a 30-foot gator that you just don't want to mess with on race day because it's like, man, this guy has got a lot of information, a lot of stuff going through his head. And then when you talk to him, he's kind of like one of the nicest, soft-spoken guys you ever meet in your life. Lee, he's a unicorn. I like Okay, I like it. I like it. Well, look, we're going to take a break. With peacock PR feathers. Race. What? He's a unicorn with peacock feathers with a knowledge of a encyclopedia. Like we just owl, we, owl. If we're going with the animal theme, it's an owl. All right. Yeah. What he yeah, it's just can we just it's get on the show? Weird. This has gone too far. 
It's Elon Warner. Yes. Is he red yet? They are great. And he is a. He's oh, red. What, what is what is the NHRA? What are they calling it? Uh, let me let me make sure. All right. Ah, uh, dang it. Uh, oh, I, I wrote it down. Uh, movers, shakers, and deal makers, which they started, I think, like this year. And he's a part of it. And he's going to clue us in. We're going to talk more about drag racing as well. Elon Warner next. Elon, Sammy, okay. did I make you? I made you blush. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <laughs> is that okay? Just, we 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 have to know. Is that like one of the best introductions you've had yes. yet, or is that, that was, the worst? That was hands down. The worst. One? I don't get very many introductions, but that was easily. That's gonna that one's gonna be hard to top. You guys are very. You guys are very kind. Yeah, I mean, but what? How do you like honestly? How do you explain who Elon Warner really is? Like. Because everyone's just going to say the generic, Elon wears so many hats and he does so many wonderful things. And it's like, okay, we've heard that before. But that's that's it. I mean, I just like helping people and I like, um, you know, working in the NHRA and other sports. And I'm, you know, I feel like I've got a skill set for it. So it comes a little bit um, easier to me now, but it's taken me a while to get to this point. Um, but yeah, I just, I just like to be helpful to as many people as I can, whether it's, you know, at, you know, at the racetrack or, you know, anywhere really. I mean, I'm a tall guy. I can't tell you how many items I've gotten off of a top shelf at a grocery store for a short person. <laughs> okay. See, Lee, remember that we have to add that to his next introduction. You know, you just don't want to see anybody struggling. So you just want to kind of help them out. And, you know, that's, that's the deal. So I was, I was, uh, I was um, pleasantly surprised is kind of an understatement when Phil Burgess called me a few weeks ago and said that they were, you know, kind of doing the movers and shakers and deal maker list. Um, I think I initially thought he was calling to ask me if I had any suggestions for people to be on the list. And then he was like, you know, we, you know, we'd like, you know, you're one of those people. And it was just really, um, you kind of work in the shadows a lot and you know you're appreciated, but to kind of get the public appreciation uh, was very nice. And I thought that list was really an interesting list of, um, of people. There's some people on that list that, that I knew there were some people on the list that I didn't know that I'm now going to become, you know, a little bit more of a fan of, um, you know, you kind of hear about people. You don't really know what exactly they do or kind of what the deal is. So um, if you told me I would ever be on a list with, uh, Josh Hart, Tony Stewart, John Force, I would like what what possible list are you putting together there? Um, but that's cool. And, and a lot of people I've, kn I've known for a long time, you know, Corey, Kelly Antonelli, and I worked together with John Force Racing for a really long time. Um, I've gotten to know Brian Loans over the years. And, you know, all the, I felt like all the people on the list were very deserving Um you know, in their own right and brought a lot to the table. So it's again, congratulations for being on the list. You certainly deserve to be on the list. I want to talk about the NHRA at this point, making mm -hmm. such a list. I am excited to like look at national dragster. I mean, I always am, but I'm like, I really want to see this issue over other issues because this list is there. I feel like they took some nods from uh, a drag illustrated, if I may say. Sure. Like, hey, we need to step up and do our own as the leaders in drag racing, the NHRA is. So what was the conversation like of them even just, hey, we need to do this and what's it going to look like? Yeah, I, I don't know what what the catalyst internally on National Dragster was. Um, I'm involved in a lot of things, but I'm, I'm not yet involved in the creation of National Dragster yet. Um that's, you know, Phil Burgess and David Kennedy, I think, um, and the writers. Um, but I think that they, what I was really fired up about and thought was really cool is 
it wasn't necessarily just a Camping World Drag Racing Series list. It wasn't just a Lucas Oil Drag Racing Series list. It was really kind of a holistic look at drag racing that contributes to the NHRA. Um, you know, so I thought that was was neat to see um, from that side. And, and um, you know, I do think that there's just a lot of so many positive things going on in the NHRA. They just thought, you know, hey, we want to kind of a lot of people ask, why are these things happening? And I think they, to their credit, wanted to show that it wasn't just the people in Glendora making it happen, that this is a big tent that we're all under. And there are people that are not on the NHRA payroll that are looking to make the NHRA as a whole a better environment for everybody. And that's where I think, um, you know, their list really um, stands out as kind of, you know, really good, um, you know, starting point. It, and it's, look, it's great that they, you know, I said it like at the top of the show, certainly drivers are the biggest stars out there, but they don't become the biggest stars out there without other people and players sure. involved, such as yourself, that don't get seen and don't get reg recognized, though they should. So I'm glad that this list from the NHRA has been crafted and put out there. It's a very cool thing to see. And, and when I first started in the NHRA in the early 90s, there was a really sizable core group of PR people from Dave Dinsmore to Susie Arnold to Jay Wells, Joe Shirk, um, Dave Ferroni, um, John and Joanna Knapp. Uh, these are people that a lot of people don't know um, anything about them, but they were doing things for Prudhomme and Kenny Bernstein and Raymond Beadle. Um, and then now I think that there is another really strong core group of PR people, um, you know, myself, Allison McCormick, Sarah Slaughter, um, you know, people that are, you know, doing PR stuff, but then also on the social media side with um, people like Sadie Glenn and Natalie Torrance and, you know, things that are Corey's doing on the video side and Terry Haddock's son. I, I think that there's now this resurgence of support people that are starting to show um, and highlight and find new avenues to promote drivers and teams. <coughs> And, you know, you just said that and you listed off an, a good group of, you know, people that you work beside and that, you know, you interact with week in and week out. And so, you know, when this news broke and like you you mentioned there before is that you're like, OK, they're contacting me to see who I would recommend. Right. And then you listed off the other people that are in this class or in this group with you. When you look at that list and you say, OK, John Force. OK, Josh Hart. Tony Stewart, or, <coughs> and you list off the names. When you say movers, shakers, and deal makers, obviously you've made a lot of deals. So we're going to take that one off of the off of the table for you. But when you look at those other two categories, which one do you think? Like, wow, Elon Warner obviously is a deal maker. He helps people make these makes these deals. But that's the easy one for you. Which other two classes do? You think like, you know what? I don't think that I do this, but I'm actually one of these people. I, I think probably the mover one, because to me, that's kind of more of an influential um, type position that I feel like I I throw out a lot of suggestions, uh, whether they're requested or not. Um, and I think that that's probably the the one right there that you think if you're moving the needle uh, you're making the sport better. Um, you know, that's probably the one that I think I take the most pride in is that, uh, you know, are you creating a lasting imprint on a sport where I've, you know, worked for 30 years? Um, so I think that's the one, um, you know, I'm not really sure about what kind of shaker I am. I don't really have, you know, the best dance moves or anything like that. And I try to, you know, keep things from shaking. Um, but I think that's probably... The, the mover one of, you know, I, I get, um, I talk to a lot of people and I really appreciate people asking me um, 
to weigh in on things. Um, and I think that's the one I take the most pride in and that I, I kind of really um, try to protect the most in that, um, you know, you, you have a lot at stake with your reputation and your reputation is only as good as how far people will trust you and just kind of really maintaining that trust and fostering it, um, you know, something that I'd really, you know, take a lot of pride in. And you certainly should. You definitely do a good job in the role that you have got yourself in. And in that role, again, you do sound off on things within the sport and people do ask you your opinion. Right now, some things within the sport mm -hmm. like the – uh, the missions food challenge too right. fast and too tasty. Uh, what has been your thoughts on it so far? It seems like it's been already a resounding yeah. success, but you've been in the sport a while. What do you see with I, it? I actually, um, I, I have friends that are in other corporate environments that talk about how I need to promote myself more and I need to, you know, put my opinions out there more. And I'm trying to do more, um, kind of, you know, professional thought process kind of deals in mission. I actually did some stuff on my LinkedIn profile about mission too fast, too tasty. And what a great uh, program I think it is because it has, it touches on every element of a successful marketing campaign, in my opinion, in, in that how they're executing it, um, both with the branding and the hats and the medals and the trophy, they've taken something that drivers or teams are already doing and amplifying it. And then they're creating um, a sense of urgency and some, you know, some sizzle to something that we've all kind of always taken for granted is like the last two days of qualifying. You know, we talk about the drama of, um, you know, trying to get into the show, but then you're also talking about trying to build rivalry. So being able to create the previous race carryover, and I think you're going to see more tracks promoting that race to race that when you kind of get into a rhythm and you know you come out of Chicago and I don't remember where we're going next maybe it's Norwalk but that the fact that Norwalk will be able to promote the rematch between you know Steve Torrance and Sean Langdon and you know Josh Hart and Tony Schumacher you know that being able to create some excitement around that I think is really going to enhance the sport enhance Saturdays draw some more eyeballs because you're going to have people talking about these rivalries and people may not know what they are. And um, I've had so many good things happen. And Lo Brian Loans has talked about this, that through the first four races of the season, there's been something that has happened at the event beyond winners and losers that has had people talking between the races, whether it was weight gate or Camry's, um, staging against Christian Quadra or, you know, Josh Hart at the four wides or, you know, you name it, at, you know, all these things have happened that, you know, winter nationals with, you know, the John force and the Coletta racing and the huge comeback they did to get the cars ready. All those things, a lot of sports have, and we haven't necessarily been able to string a lot of that stuff together to get our consciousness they're getting the sports consciousness away from drag racing. I think that's really important, but the mission too fast, too tasty, I think is an amazing um, product. Actually, I saw um, some of the standups that they're creating of the drivers that will be in stores, which has always been something I've really advocated or tried to get more sponsors to do is bring our drivers into consumer America. So when you go into a grocery store and then you see a, Justin Ashley stand up, you think, oh, this guy's a big deal. He has a stand up. You know, there's a Camry Crusoe stand up. There'll be Sean Langdon. There'll be J.R. Todd. There'll be John Force. You know, I think you want to see that kind of away from the track awareness um, to help grow the sport. So when someone sees that in their grocery store and then they hear a commercial, they see a digital ad on Instagram, they have a better idea of what the hell we're talking about. Yeah, stand-ups are powerful. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got I, – I had a Indiana Jones stand-up that I stole out of the Joy Theater in Texarkana, Texas. I mean, <laughs> you want to see you want to see people 
going in with their buddies and creating a diversion in dairy so they can steal a Justin Ashley stand up out of the you know tortilla section. Right. Yes, I'm I completely not advocating agree. that, but I'm just saying it's kind of cool when people yep. want to get your stuff out of the store. I I and think they, it's cool that you found a theater in Texarkana. Hey, the Joy Theater man had a drive in and an in you know regular indoor theater. Okay. Okay. I think there needs to be PR and like challenges. I mean, I don't condone it, but you know, I mean, hey, where can you find a Justin Ashley or you know, Josh they, Hart stand up? They had uh, Brittany Force had monster stand ups for like when they first got the deal, and um, we would see people taking them out of stores. When I watched someone take one out of a store one time, thought it was really kind of cool. You know, like if you okay, but if you take one of those out the store, you have to bring it to the track and like turn oh, it in do. for a shirt or something, yeah, we, or we, like we get see, it signed. We would see people would bring them <laughs> to the track, and we know that they would. You know, if you have a stand up, you know, you'd be like, "Hey, where? You know, where'd you get that?" And they would be, "Oh, I got it from the convenience store up the street." Okay, well, you know, the convenience store's not giving it away, <laughs> but they're, you know, they're going to bring it and get it signed. I mean. Uh, the other thing, when we had, when Ashley Force was racing, they did, Sanyo was one of our sponsors, the TV company. And they had her picture on the box for 64-inch or 50-inch TVs, flat screens. Oh, my God. We had people bringing those boxes into the track. And there's there's a couple things that just drive you insane at a racetrack. One for me is people carrying tires. Oh, absolutely. I just, why? Why? I, I just, I really want to stop and just ask them, do you not understand how tires work? But to see people, I can't, these guys with these huge cardboard <laughs> boxes that their TV came in, lugging them around. And then you would, it's one thing to kind of bring it in, get it signed, take it out back out to your car. I get that. But these were guys that would have them with them all day. Like, yeah. And I'm like, that's our fan. I love them. You know, they, but yeah, the guys that have, you know, that will keep up with a slick all day and carrying it over their shoulder, you know, they're not signing on the flat part. They're signing on the side. So it's okay to roll it. But yeah, yeah. it's, but yeah, but but I but also you're talking. I mean, you guys have seen my office. I have more random crap in my office of you know five quart oil things from John Force, broken pieces of race cars, you know hats, medals, um, you know you name you know you just kind of collect that stuff because it's unique. And um, you know I have some power built tools. That's my latest. You know, power built tools put Camry on one of their ratchet sets. So I was at SEMA. And I'm just sitting there talking to Desiree Martinez and just, you know, getting get caught up. And they just had him on display. And I just didn't even think about it. Didn't even realize what my role was. So oh, Camry's on that. I just picked one up and just kind of put it in my pocket. And Desiree kind of gave me a look like, you know, you don't have to be sneaky about that. You can just <laughs> take one, have one. But I was like, oh, I just don't want to be super obvious. I just kind of picked one up and just kind of slid it in my pocket and, you know, have it in my office because that, that's just kind of stuff. And it drives my wife crazy. It's like, why do we have all this stuff? Well, it's kind of cool. I mean, yeah. So, but yeah, so things like that. Um, you know, I know there's been talk of track attrition. Um, and I think that's, that is cyclical, I think, in all professional sports. I mean, you can look at every, you know, big time sport and they have their various struggles. I mean, the Oakland A's are leaving Oakland to go to Las Vegas. You know, the teams in, in Florida are not drawing anyone to baseball games. There's NFL teams that are struggling with their, to fill their stadiums. That is you know, actually so a beautiful I think, thing. I don't think, yes, it's, it's unfortunate that urban sprawl, is impacting us, but luckily it's a big country. I think the the positives of that of NHRA do create opportunities for people to see an investment opportunity. Um, but I don't, 
I don't begrudge the Bandamere's one iota for they they oh they operated a racetrack incredibly successfully for sixty five years. Let's wrap. I mean, they're they're an original six. I mean, they are the Boston Bruins, the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, the Boston Celtics, whatever you want to call it. They don't owe anyone any kind of an apology for not operating a drag strip. They impacted millions of people over the 65 years with jobs, with, you know, places to race, with entertainment. You know, um, and they are genuine in their interest. They want it. They would like to keep going. But if they don't, we should just say thank you for having a racetrack for 65 years. I think we've done a huge thing in Arizona to show the folks um, with the, the Gila um, River Foundation reservation about, you know, there's interest there. Um, you can't do anything about Houston. I mean, when that place, you know, Texas is just exploding in every direction around every city, um, you know, the motorplex is in a, is in a great spot, you know, but eventually it, it's going to it, the sprawl is going to get to everybody. And what we want to have is big events and events that are so big, like the Stampede of Speed or the Super Bowl, that people just tolerate 10 days or two weeks or four days of inconvenience because it's such a good thing. The other 361 days that you just kind of, you know, oh, well, yeah, it's kind of an inconvenient deal, but it's also kind of cool. You know, Wrigley Field is right in the middle of a neighborhood. Lambeau Field is right in the middle of a neighborhood. You know, just lean into it. Lean into the fact that you have this cool thing going on. Um, you know, so I am hopeful there's going to be some new markets for us. Um, I don't have any idea what those are or kind of where how they're going to all work out. Um, but the one thing is if... If you lose national events, I think that opens up opportunities for more specialty events to really be, you know, more night under fire type events. Um, you know, maybe some barnstorming events in the fall, you know, in the off season, maybe some racing in Europe where you get, you know, the top five finishers and each, you know, go and race, you know, in, in the Middle East, in Europe or Australia. You know, whatever it is, because, you know, there's that's creates opportunity that somebody could step into and, you know, create a chance, to, you know, to have an event. So I it's like just going it. to gonna be just kind of whether or not that can that can happen. But I think the the star power we have coming up in the sport with the younger drivers, I think the excitement you know in pro stock motorcycle pro stock top fuel fun i mean i think now you're looking at um looking at the grandstands when a fuel dragster and funny car are running they're not empty grandstands anymore that used to be a complete ghost town now you're seeing more people staying in the grandstands because they have a vested interest in these up-and-coming drivers you know, whether it's Megan Meyer or Travis Shoemake or, you know, some of these other young, second generation um, A fuel drivers, I think there's some some sizzle there. And I think a lot of, the, you know, these influencers are really helping with that. Um, I'd like to, I'm excited Ron Caps is racing SRX. I've already booked my ticket before Topeka to fly to Indy on Thursday morning. I'm going to drive over to Eldora. I'm going to watch that race, drive back to Indy Thursday night, get up early Friday morning and fly to Topeka, fly to Kansas City and drive to Topeka, just strictly to support SRX having one of our drivers in their series. You know, that's what we need. And the, the unfortunate thing about drag racing is we don't have right now the capability to have a IROC type series where we can like a like a class that you can bring IndyCar and NASCAR guys over 
and give them an equitable thrill of what we do, you know, and that kind of deal, you know. I think honestly, our probably our closest option is Pro Mod. That you could set up some Pro Mod cars to be very user friendly and maybe have a go with that. And I would love to see, you know, something like that happen. I mean, you're not gonna put a guy in a top field dragster. It's just not gonna, I mean, you just can't do it. And I've talked, I mean, as much as you'd like to have it be factory stock, you know, the FlexJet factory stock showdown is, you know, excited to have them back for four wide racing, but those cars are hard to drive. You know, Jeff Turk is an amazing driver. I think that guy's got more skins on the wall and he's the, he's the Chuck Yeager of factory X. I can't wait to see him the next time. I'm so thankful. They, but I was like, dude, I go, you're, you're the Chuck Yeager of factory X. You're figuring this stuff out at 200 miles per hour. You know, and he did an amazing job. I read that Competition Plus article. He did an amazing job of explaining what happened on his incident. And people don't understand the subtleties of because where his parachute button was off a couple inches, you know, that was just enough to get, you know, to create this chain of events. And people don't think about, well, I get in my funny car and everything's all where it's kind of supposed to be. That's because Dale Armstrong and Raymond Beadle you know, and Roger Gustin figured it out 45 years ago. And John Ford, I mean, guys are still out there. So I think there's there's a lot to be said for where our sport's going, the positive impact people are having and continue to have. And I think bringing it full circle, kind of the creation of this movers and shakers list has kind of added a level of, I know for me personally, you know, is, is this list a one-time deal? Will there be 25 new people next year? Will it become an annual list? Will it become every three or four years? I mean, do you want to, obviously I would like to stay on the list, um, but you know, do they find 25 new people next year or how, what's the, you know, cause that's, you know, now you're like, man, I'm on the list. I don't want to fall off the list. Now you got a rep to, you know, to defend a little bit. So, uh, really well, fall off the list. Well, I mean, yeah. you, you know, I mean, you just want to get to keep coming up with ideas, and everybody's got a few, you know, rabbits up their sleeves, you know. So, I don't want to, you know, tip my hand too much, but you know, we all, it's it's been really great. I've, I've loved this year because all the PR people really work well together. We all, you know, from the NHRA side and the team side, but we also know it's a zero sum game and there's a finite amount of exposure, but there's also opportunities to get new exposure. And I love seeing the things like Allison McCormick posted on Instagram, like she did some NASCAR driving experience. And then like, you know, she posted some something that's like, Oh, and I've got some cool things coming up. Well, that piques my interest, you know, Sarah Slaughter doing some stuff with wrestlers before, internationals and we've got some cool things coming up with the wwe okay you know i've got you know some cool things coming up with camry and justin and, and josh and drivers that i work with and drivers that you know buddy holes doing some cool things and you know tj zizzo is going to be back racing this year um you know so you're all kind of you know it's competitive and you want to challenge everybody to just get better to promote the sport and i think we've really never been in a better spot than we are right now because the NHRA is encouraging that by opening up the content creator area at the track and encouraging people to bring influencers out. There was a time when that was not the case at all. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yep. Uh, nope. <laughs> I mean, you guys can both speak to that. I mean, now, you know, when you guys build your time machine, you guys are going to want to come back to maybe 2023 with your great ideas versus 20, you know, 17, when you're like, Hey, I've got this great idea. And people are like, you guys are batshit crazy. Get out of here. You're not, yeah, right. you're not big time media. Well, now right. if you I mean, if you rolled in now with Monday morning racer with your look and your following, I hate to say it, 
Lee, but they'd roll out a red carpet for you now. Now they just kind of take advantage of you. Now you've just kind of been around and you've just kind of. I, yeah, I've just been around. I just, I, cause I can tell you when I like, first showed up, it was docking, it was docking and dodging, dodging in between yeah. the trailers. You know? Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you know, you have like, you know, six different hats. So they can't really tell. There's the guy with the green hat and the shades and the beard. And oh, no, that, that's a different guy. That guy's wearing a red hat. That's probably not the same guy. Those are different pit vipers. Uh, maybe, you know. <clears throat> you know, so now I think it, it is more welcoming. I think you're seeing more, and I still want to see more shoulder programming, you know, and I think there's opportunities for that to happen. Um, you know, and it's a little bit of a technology thing. It's a little bit of a awareness thing. Um, and it's a time thing too. I mean, we, you know, we talk about wanting to do all this shoulder programming, but man, well, by the time we get done with a race, you just want to go and just, sit down because we're all doing all this stuff. And I think, you know, as things grow, you know, the NHRA marketing department's getting bigger, which is great that their social media teams get a little better. So I think that's opening up some opportunities to see more things, you know, behind the scenes, videos, top end videos, things like that. You're going to see more of because one person isn't having to do 50 things. Right. Right. So Elon, so you mentioned, the big one of the biggest events that NHRA has now, and it's going to continue to grow. Stampede of Speed. Yep. What can you clue us in on that is oh. in store at the Texas Motorplex this year? Probably the the biggest thing is um, opening weekend. We're going to do. We've moved the Scott Palmer Nitro Sideshow to that Friday, that opening Friday night, and then we're going to go from that to two a two day. Uh, country concert with a Saturday's kind of a nineties country. And then Sunday is more Nashville country. And then we're going to roll. We're going to do a media day, a celebrity event on Monday, and then some sportsman racing on Tuesday, the professional testing. It'll be exciting to have the ch second champions dinner. Uh, we're adding in more um, sideshow acts at the national event to create um, you know, we started out with Grace Good um, last year. Um, we'll still have Rodney the Clown. I mean, he's become an iconic part of Stampede of Speed. Um, we're going to have more Cowboys, more filler type people in conjunction with the NHRA, where you're seeing more like uh, just the basics with Cameron Crusoe, 10 questions with Jason Logan, Nitro School. So there's more entertainment value off the track as well as on the track. And creating a show that is much more like SeaWorld, where you have your big events and you have your side events and you can go and get your cotton candy and beer. Um, but I think probably the biggest thing with the Stampede of Speed is just the presence and the flow. And we're tightening the event up to where we now are getting its quality entertainment from the beginning. When you come through the gate at five o'clock in the afternoon on Friday night until 10 o'clock on Friday night, that Friday night live is a full on nonstop show of excitement. I'm talking to the guys this weekend at ZMAX about how do we get more firebombs? We need more explosions off the track versus on the track. And how do we make that more of a WWE hype fest um, working with Laney, our, our, our sound um, and music guy with Jason Logan, um, we're going to bring in um, another celebrity. Uh, we want to kind of look at possibly bringing a celebrity announcer back. I need to talk to the NHRA about that and, you know, get buy-in from Alan Reinhardt and Joe and those guys to make sure they're comfortable with it because that's their office. And we want to make sure, you know, we brought Jack Beckman in last year. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. You know, is an opportunity to do that again? Is there an opportunity, you know, we'll have the legends again. I think people will be really surprised and pleased with our, you know, our racing legend and then our kind of support person legend. Um, you know, so all those cool elements um, are just going to continue to make that event bigger and better. And I'm excited about the champions dinner. We're going to try to get more former fall national winners at that event on Wednesday night and then really celebrate um, last year's winners one last time. And I think that's one thing every track should embrace is, Winning your event should be a big deal. You know, you should celebrate that every year, your former winners and your new winners, um, especially first-time winners. So, you know, this year, the 
Um, the entrees will be selected by Erica Enders and Hector Rana Jr. And then the desserts will be selected by uh, Ron Caps and Justin Ashley. So we'll flip flop that every year. So, um, so that makes that a really a unique event that you're getting to, you know, dine with the former winners, dine with the former champions, and then you're also getting their personal touch on the menu. It was certainly a great event last year. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, being there and y'all building on it. That is going to be great. The whole Stampede of Speed, what a great oh, model it is for all the One other thing I forgot, we got Jeg's All-Stars this year at Stampede of Speed. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be a whole nother element that we are going to roll up the red carpet for the Jeg's All-Stars. We want to have them be a part of the Fan Fest on Thursday night with the Camping World driver. So that autograph session on Thursday night will get even bigger because we'll have as many Camping World participants there, but also we want to shine a light on the Jegs All-Stars at that event. And, we, you know, we'll have the Jegs All-Stars. <coughs> and that's an, amazing, that's an amazing event that I, you know, I've kind of have a, a good understanding of, but now that I'm really understanding what it takes to become a Jegs All-Star, I mean, that's, that is a significant accomplishment that should be celebrated, and we're fired up to have it as part of the Stampede of Speed, and we want to have more signature events inside the Stampede as we can. Elon, is there a possible way to get a pros versus Joes race in at the <clears throat> Um, I think so. You know, and are you thinking like, hey, you want to have – John Force like, race a slam and Sam. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm not ruling it out. I, I would like to see more. Um, you know, this is away from the motorplex, but I'd like to see more. Is there a way some events to create an opportunity to get back to potentially top fuel racing funny car? Is there a way, you know, I've I've pitched this idea publicly and privately that if we could get the money right, because I understand it comes down to money on some of these things. I would love, and there's only two places we'll be able to do this, Vegas or Charlotte. But I would love to see after the final round on Sunday, 45 minutes, an hour, you race top fuel winner, funny car winner, pro stock winner, pro stock bike winner, Bracketed start, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollar, whatever it is, winner take all. That would be sick. Yeah, I think that would be insane, and I think it's doable. I think you could, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the appropriate spacing is, but I don't know if it's the nitro guys on the outside lanes in lane one and four and the pro stock guys on the inside lanes, or is it better to have the pro stock guys on lanes one and four, the nitro guys in the middle, but I would just love to just see that whole, you know, or is it just pro stock motorcycle, pro stock car, funny car, top field dragster. And then you basically just motorcycle guy takes off pro stock person takes off funny car guy, and then bam, top fuel, and then they're all just bombing to the finish line. I think that would be must-see TV. I was just thinking, I, that would be, I mean, that'd be epic, but I think the media people, like you and um, Natalie Torrance, and, yeah. you know, get old Bobby in there, but obviously wrap the car in saran wrap and bubble wrap with him getting in the car. Um, you know, Lee, we all know that Lee can't drive, so Come get on. Lee out in the car and and you know have have a media have a media race and get yeah. you know get a sponsor yeah. for that. I think that'd be pretty cool just to you know have something like that. Brian yeah, Lone Bra versus Dragon Rights. I get it. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think those kind of events are you know in some level, way, shape, and form are on the horizon because I think we're just seeing more opportunity. Um, you know, I think you're you know I think I saw a deal where I don't know is it. Um, is it no prep is kind of starting some team stuff? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that that's, that would be cool if we were to have an all-star event for drag racing, you know, could it be a team event where you might have two or three top fuel guys, two or three funny car guys, two or three pro stock guys, two or three pro stock motorcycle guys, all racing and earning points in a 
Jake's all-star type format where I could just see it comes down to the motorcycle final to see which team wins. And you've got Tony Schumacher and Matt Hagen and, you know, Eric Enders all up there rooting for this, you know, their pro stock motorcycle teammate who they've been social with, but never really been on a team with. I think that would just help elevate the whole camping world series. So I think, you know, there's any number of ideas, but it just comes down to, um, you know, scheduling, practicality, you know, money, and then also making it, you know, not too um, amateurish kind of deal. But I think there's some opportunities out there. I think there's interest globally for drag racing. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very excited about the future of the sport. Well, Elon, again, Sure. Congratulations. You definitely are Thank you very much. a mover, shaker, and deal maker. And so glad that the NHRA created such a list and do hope that we see it again. Thank you for the time on the show. Yep, and sure. yeah, people just need to listen to you more often. Well, I don't know about that. I have, I've had some harebrained ideas, but we'll, you know, I tell people all the time, I get in these meetings and I, I throw out one good idea and I was like, I should just shut up. Because eventually <laughs> I just, you know, every, it's just, you fly too close, too close to the sun sometimes. But, um, <laughs> Hey, I appreciate you guys. I love, obviously, you know, I love what you guys do every Tuesday night. And, um, you know, we'll look forward to seeing you guys, you know, Z-Max and down the road. And um, just really appreciate you guys doing everything that you guys do. No, thank, thank you, you Elon. <clears throat> we probably don't say it enough, but thank you for week in, week out, helping us book guests and everything yes, you've thank you. done for yeah. both of us in the sport. And we appreciate it. So, sure. again, thank Happy you to help. for everything. All right, guys. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good I do like what Matt Clark off of Elon Warner's statement mentions NHRA Thunder Down Under. It'd be cool to see some more NHRA stars go down and participate in Australia and overseas. That would be cool, as Elon uh, mentioned. And a lot of great ideas there. Glad to have Elon on and good to talk with Ryan. Folks, sorry, we weren't able to have Jim Halsey as advertised. We'll have to definitely have him on again. He is on a tear in the PDRA world. Sam, uh, what is in store for you? Well, seeing it at the weather, uh, I didn't like the forecast, so I'm not going to Z-Max. I am going to stay in the 50-degree weather here in North Dakota. Um, Lee, I know I've been saying this for a while. You're probably sick of hearing it, but I'm actually, this week, I got to make a phone call tomorrow, but I'm going to bring back a different version of In the Groove podcast, and we're just going to break down who these people really are um, and what's going on in the state of motorsports as it is right now. Uh, there's been so many changes and so much stuff going on here, there, and in between. So I'm hoping um, the gentleman who I reached out to can answer, and if not, I'll be reaching out to a few other people here in the next couple of weeks. But bringing that back on, I'm going to um, give you a little insight of Miley, as I call her. That is the white Fox body Mustang that everyone has seen. Uh, new updates have been done and finished on her. So I'm super excited uh, to continue on that project. And who knows, maybe we might see me in a, in a fire suit sooner rather than later, in the words of Mark Caruso. So... Yeah, who knows? Very cool, very cool. Uh, That's why I kind of maybe like the new rules that are maybe implemented a little bit. I hear so, you, I hear you, I hear you. Hey, we got Mopar right. and Maddie in the comment section saying hello. Hello, Mopar Maddie. You all go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow her on social media, someone that yes. you're definitely will be, be following in the future. She will be one of my guests once I've, I've got a list of them. Uh, you're going to be coming back on, and it's going to be a total different take of what we went through before. But I hear you. We're not talking about cereal the next time. Yeah, we are. 
like that's my first leading question for that's you. The first leading question, yes. Dude, okay, speaking of that, you remember that like super good Mexican food place I had as a sponsor? Yes. They close. They're closing their doors tomorrow here in oh. North Dakota, and they're moving to Oklahoma to start. Like this is this is how crazy this is. She just had a primarily takeout restaurant, fast food, right? Yeah. She's moving to Oklahoma to start a takeout and a sit down restaurant. So she's starting. From what she's made up here, she's taken it to do two restaurants. So today I went and I had my last burrito from there. And I'm like, dude, like one of my major sponsors are leaving. Like, and we had like a 45 minute conversation about that. But she's like, it doesn't matter. I'll still be a part of you. Like, you know, that's not going to change. She's like, now you just have people in Oklahoma that can have my food. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like, there you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, Well, man, look. Uh, look forward to that. Keep us updated. I uh, Thursday night, last Thursday night, traveling and just scheduling. It was tough. Didn't have between the slicks, but it's back on tonight. Uh, not tonight. Thursday night. Rich McPhillips. So the people behind Tony Stewart getting the win, the team. Yeah, the team spokesman, you could say. We're going to have him on and chat about, well, McPhillips racing. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, you've been kicking it hard and been doing it and grinding. So that's always nice to see and support that. So if you guys haven't done already, go over and check out his U- his YouTube channel, Monday Morning Racer. I am Outlaw Performance ENT, Slam and Sam, the one part of the competition plus power hour to Bobby Bennett, to Darren Williams Jr., to Elon Warner, <clears throat> Monday Morning Racer, Slam and Sam, and the whole gang over at Competition Plus, where you can believe what you read. This has been another episode of the Competition Plus Power Hour with Flying Ryan Ayler and the magical man, the mythical creature. And I know I'm not talking about Mickey Mouse. I'm talking about Mr. Mover and Shaker and Deal Maker, Elon Warner himself. Till next time, y'all keep the pedal to the metal. God bless. And we are out. If you want to take your vehicle's performance to new heights, you got to give it P. Like our original equipment technology, antifreeze and cooling, our formulas match the vehicle manufacturer's technology requirements so that we have the perfect match for every vehicle. That's one reason why Peak is among the fastest growing brands of coolant in America. We work harder to earn the trust of people like you every day.